Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, it's my uh, real pleasure uh, today to uh, sort of interrupt my, my previously scheduled programming. You're in the middle of my, my interactive art studio advanced course, uh, but today we have a special guest um, who we've interposed into our normal class schedule uh, as a Steiner visitor lecturer um, in our uh, lecture series here at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Um, for the video, my name is Golan Levin. I'm professor of electronic art here at Carnegie Mellon. I'm director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, our research lab for atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and programs at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Uh, today, it's my terrific pleasure to um, host uh, an artist presentation by Roman Verostko. Roman uh, is one of the probably first dozen or so artists in the world to use a computer to make art. Um, uh, he appears in the legendary Artist and Computer book by Ruth Levitt, 1974-1975, uh, which is a kind of survey of the couple dozen people at the time who were the intrepid explorers of the use of the computer as an artistic medium. And um, currently, uh, he's based in Minneapolis. Um, he's been associated for a long time with MCAD, the, the Minnesota, Minnesota College of Arts and Design. Got the mic a little hot here. I'm going to step back a bit. Um, and uh, I think I'm just going to take, just let, let Roman take it away. He's been working, you know, as an artist with the computer since 69 or 70. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his, one year from today, he's, he's currently in the planning stages of a retrospective exhibition at the, the Theological Seminary in Latrobe, um, St. Vincent, which is where he graduated in 19, you, you entered it in 49. You, you, we, you graduated from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh in, in 1949. That's correct. And then you started at the, at the, at the Theological Seminary in Latrobe, nearby Latrobe. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome for Roman Verosco. Thank you all for being patient while I try to get things working. Yes, I've been working with, I guess, my first experiences with computers date back to about 1969. Uh, but uh, the older I get, the more and more difficult it becomes, but we're here. Uh, today I want to take a look at some of my history and how I got to be, how it was, let's say around 1949, when I painted these uh, Coke ovens on a small panel about this size, and I was a student at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. The question we have is, how is it that I went from painting Coke ovens to making drawings such as this cyber flower, which is now in the collection of the Victoria and Albert in London, uh, which dates uh, from 2008, I think I have. So that's a big question. How did it happen that I went from these Coke ovens to my cyber flowers and other computer generated work? This drawing here is a pen plotted drawing, and I hope by the end of this talk you'll have a little better sense of how I got there and how this happened. Of course, my life as an artist professionally began when I was at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. By the way, the Art Institute in those days was located on, um, excuse me, on Sixth Avenue, and um, right close to Kaufman's department store, which was close to 6th Street. I guess it was between 6th and 7th on, on Smithfield. That top floor, by the way, was um, up here, was for life class. And my teacher in life class and portraiture was, um, was, I think it was John, anyway, it was Nesbert. And he was the one who painted the murals during the 30s in the Pittsburgh courthouse. I began wanting to be an illustrator, and here's a drawing I made for a story that I wrote. I wanted to write my stories and illustrate them, and this was my Christmas stocking story, which is interesting, even morally, but it gives you some sense of my ambition at the time was to be something like Norman Rockwell. Uh, oh, I was just telling in my conversation with Golan that it would have been approximately either 69 or 70 years ago when I was in this building interviewing with the dean of the art school here at Carnegie 
making a decision as to whether I would go to this venerable institution, St. Vincent Arch Abbey Seminary and College in La Trobe, Pennsylvania, or would I come to do graduate work in art here at Carnegie? Well, I made the fateful decision to become a monk, and yes, I was for, um, it was a great experience for me in those days. Um, St. Vincent's a venerable institution, the oldest monastery in North America, and I have great respect for the monastery, the monks, and the educators there. And um, when I arrived, there is beyond this building here where I'm pointing, where these trees are, there is a courtyard. And in that courtyard, in 1954, I painted this fresco-like mural, or so I thought it was going to last. It didn't go past one winter in Pennsylvania winters. But it was my version of angels, and this vision, this version we have here was the um, pastel model that I had drawn on, black, on a black ground paper. But it was indeed like this, and it was the um, Shrine of St. Thomas, who was the patron saint of seminarians. And I want to say one quick thing about medieval scholastic, what we called, what some have referred to as the medieval scholastic habit. It was Erwin Panofsky who made this observation when he wrote his volume on Gothic art and architecture, which is important in the history of architecture. And what one learns in a, a good student of medieval philosophy and learning learns this. You're going to learn uh, what the schoolmen knew in argument, in rational argument, one must always do sufficient enumeration, the range of subject. One must do, arrange those items enumerated in sufficient articulation, meaning homologous, like parts go with like parts. And you need to learn deductive cogency, which means sufficient interrelation, inferability. I can't say how important that became in my life. Never did I dream that one day this kind of habit and discipline would lead me to work with code. But the first, I think, important work I created, uh, it still exists, but it's not mounted, but it were angel choirs. The, these figures were made out of copper, and the copper was oxidized, so it turned green, and it was mounted on that wall to replace the um, uh, disastrous effort uh, with fresco. Uh, later, when this wall was dismounted, these uh, figures have been preserved, and maybe someday we'll remount them. Uh, one thing I'll say kind of quickly is you will notice I have outlined, and you could find this on my website, uh, the ver there, there are groupings. There's a center group, which is really the highest of them all, the seraphim, the thrones, the cherubim, then left the powers, the virtues, the dominations, and then over here the principalities, archangels, and angels. Uh, this whole arrangement of threes and threes and threes is based on a treatise uh, by um, uh, what was referred to as the Dennis the Areopagus in his celestial hierarchy. If you look at my website, you can find a reference, and you can go see his writing, and you will discover that his writing was very logical. How close it is to reality, that's another question. But what it does do is it teaches one a habit of thinking uh, and meditation, and that was worthwhile. But as I grew in those days, uh, I was allowed to continue. In fact, I was invited to continue uh, my extended studies as a monk and a priest. I went off to study in New York. But in the process of all of this, I became drawn to um, influences by Wasi Kandinsky, uh, who wrote an, a very interesting treatise on concerning the spiritual in art, and Piet Mondrian. They were influences on my work. Uh, you, I could say that Kandinsky led me to understand that one could create an art form analogous to music. It, that, and he was interested in art forms that transcended politics. They weren't, 
uh, he, was, he was resisting the social realism of the Soviet Union, and he was very interested in something that went beyond the mundane concerns of politics and so, so, uh, that, that kind of issue and uh, the material object. So that was interesting for me. The other person was Piet Mondrian. I could mention others too, including Barbara Hepworth, and I could go on, but I'll limit myself to this. Mondrian uh, taught me to be able to think in terms of visual experience apart from visual representation, rep apart from visual representation. So you, one could say that <clears throat> the dynamic equilibrium, what's dynamic equilibrium? Well, it means like even in this work where you have the so-called plus and minus period of Mondrian's work, uh, he was interested in the oppositions between vertical and horizontal and the tensions between them, and he went from landscape eventually to his so-called plus and minus period. He was interested uh, because he was a theosophist, which is a whole other interesting matter. Um, he was interested in what he called a universal harmony, a cosmic order, and this is what led him in his work uh, to, um, uh, to, to play with this kind of geometry, both in terms of the push and pull of color and the horizontal and vertical um, dynamics. So what we had during that period in my work, I was in New York, in Manhattan, and I had... Um, uh, played with um, geometric structures. This was my sunrise on West 34th Street because I was stationed on West 34th Street and I had a studio on top of a, 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 a rectory with St. Michael's and it became pretty well known in New York in those days. And then I went off also to Paris. But what you would discover in this period of my life that I worked with two different kinds of things. I worked with geometric elements, constructivist elements, and I also worked with a kind of an abstract expressionist thing. Abstract expressionism, part of it is involved in understanding the nature of brushstroke, mark, and that mark in relationship to the person mark making, you could say, or expressing. But it's not intended to represent, um, it's another kind of visual activity that draws us uh, to experience the activity of the drawing itself. The drawing then, one can talk about it in relationship to human experience, and that's a whole other matter. But let's just leave it at that for now and go on. And I think my most important work in my monastic period of work, which took uh, place in the, my most important work would date after about 1963, as I developed what I, what is, I call my new city series. Um, the base for a painting like this, a painting like this is three feet by three feet. Um, and it is, um, has a white gesso base, it's on plywood. The plywood is brushed with steel brush first, then everything is built up with a white gesso on top of that. Then I, work with, um, I worked with various um, acrylic washes, and on top of that then with a, another base, I laid out the geometry. What one discovers in a work like this is that two things happen. You have the spontaneity on the one hand of the um, um, markings and the soft modulation of the color. And on the other hand, you have very severe geometric rational placement. In fact, I could just point out how there are many ways the golden ratio, that is the, um, what we call the golden ratio, um, however we want to refer to that, uh, that um, where the smaller is to the larger, as the larger is to the whole. This is what we find when we look at the, the growth of a seashell, the galaxies. It's something quite universal, um, the so-called golden ray. So, so we had this rational and spontaneous elements in the same field. This is repeated as I was leaving monastic life even. I, towards the end, I was working also with highly expressive brushwork. Uh, my so-called El Passe series, it's, it's a French expression quoted from scripture, Corinthians, 
And it, um, it said, the face of this world is passing away. And I was drawn with the fact of my own changing and my own growing and changing. And this was a period in my life uh, when I was on the threshold of leaving my monastic life, not because I didn't respect and appreciate the life, there are many rich experiences, uh, but some things that I didn't believe and couldn't continue to adhere to made it difficult for me to continue. But one of the last great works at the monastery would have been this casting. It's eight feet by eight feet. It's reinforced concrete. It's a load-bearing wall in the new monastery that was built, incidentally designed by Pittsburgh architect Tasso Katselos, who lives not too far from here. And it was his idea that we <clears throat> embed these castings in the walls of the monastery. So this was my brother casting which is located inside the um, reception room, uh, uh, the, the, the archabbot's reception room at, at, the, at the monastery. Where, how did it emerge? It emerged from spontaneous brush strokes like this. And these I burned into styrofoam, which was eight, eight, eight inch thick styrofoam, four by eight panels. Um, we had a source for these uh, styrofoam uh, in, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, so it made it very interesting for me. So you can see the process I went through to get to this, to get to this. By the way, the Chinese thing on the background is longevity. It's a, um, a later, I never knew at the time that I would end up teaching in China and learn quite a bit about Shufa and Chinese uh, calligraphy. Um, so anyway, let's go from there to <clears throat> a transition, the transition then from idea in mind, the ideas and everything in my head about making those works, to the I, taking these I, I, to ideas in code. So from ideas in mind guiding the hand to ideas in code guiding the machine. I think it began with me, uh, even while I was still in the monastery, I did a whole series, I created a series of works called the Psalms in Sound and Image. And these were shown broadly over 25 institutions in 1966 and 1967. And I used an audiovisual synchronizer. Here you see me manipulating the controls of, well, there's a, um, uh, there are speakers connected to all of this, projectors and a synchronizer. And so what happens is that the finished work was presented in a space, often floor to ceiling uh, projection. In this instance, we had pillows on the floor. So the student, this was hippie time. Students sit on the floor and it was very dramatic and to have this loud sound and his image flipping and everyone is kind of, um, Interesting, would say it that way. These are my electronically synchronized audiovisual programs, and they were used also for spiritual retreats, and some of them are quite provocative. And uh, we will have one, I'm sure, on exhibition at St. Vincent next year when we open my exhibition there. Uh, here, for example, when I traveled that show to over 25 venues, it was in Chicago, Kansas, <laughs> Washington, I can't tell you how many, but what the electronic equipment and program traveled to over 26 colleges and universities. And we shipped the, um, my equipment in this trunk, and I still have it, and um, I think Andy, I think St. Vincent can have it back. I took it with me when I left the monastery over 50 years ago. It's, uh, and I had it this way, fragile, electronic equipment, it went by Railway Express, and. Um, there's a little bit of a text here. The weekend there was full of surprises and this kind of doodles. Uh, as I said, um, it was something like how it was in those days. Well, that's past now. In 1969, I was presenting a lecture. It's a long story. It was on, by the way, it was on the Hill Collection at St. John's Abbey in um, uh, Minnesota and I was at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design on the faculty. And I um, had the opportunity, I had already been introduced to computers and computing industry in Minneapolis, which was immense at that time. 
And I, at UNIVAC, I had um, Minnesota, I had the opportunity to film this cube flipping to infinity and back, and there were other configurations. And I learned then that all of this animation was done with code, just writing code. There were no, no drawings, just instructions. I couldn't believe that. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to learn what that's about. I was very interested because at the College of Art and Design, when we taught animation, the students had to, um, we had cameras, and one made a drawing, one photographed it, then one made another one and another one, like Walt Disney did. But never did we ever have this type of thing, you see. So um, that's when I uh, um, became involved also with the Tetra Corporation. Uh, that was a startup, and uh, I, I was even partly invested in it with what little bit we had, but it all failed. But this is what I have as a memory. I'm calling a Circuit Mine 1970 Tetra Corporation Memorial. But I was invited to be a humanistic advisor to the Tetra Corporation, and that's where I started to learn about circuits and the logic of circuits. And at the same time, I had studied uh, um, computer concepts that control data um, in Minnesota. What you need to know is that control data, UNIVAC, um, um, supercomputers, all of these places were located, Honeywell International, all the headquarters were in Minneapolis. They were Minneapolis Industries. It was a kind of a Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. This would have been in the 1960s and 70s. And many of those people who helped develop the, let's say, if you were active in computer graphics in those days, you would have used Gopher. Where was Gopher from? It was from the Gopher State, University of Minnesota Science Department. And then we also had the uh, Geometry Center at the University of Minnesota. So it was a hotbed of software and uh, cir circuitry. And that's when I first became aware in 1984, I believe it was the first time I went to a Seagraf conference. So what did I learn after studying a little bit of language? First thing, when I got my PC, I was able to create my so-called magic hand of chance. And maybe we can just get a little peek at what, how that looks. Uh, this particular program that occupies only 32 KB of space, imagine that. It can go on for a month and not repeat itself exactly because it's generative. It will, every time it loops around, we change the seed and we get a whole new sequence, as, you pro as many of you probably know if you work with software. And I also built dictionaries so that it could occasionally play a, um, a kind of a, um, a word thing, a word poem. I'll let it come to at least one, and that will give you an idea how that works. Uh, but uh, the, the magic hand of chance itself is a very good example of what I would call the, 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 the dance between chaos and order, serendipity and control and logical uh, procedure. So the sayings of Umphilus are an example. So here's an example. Umphilus decides to speak on glory. The perpendicular glory periodically pushes delay fearfully before glory conserves. So this, now what you're seeing here is a um, video. I can't run the original easily here. I can set it up for you. Then you would see that next time around it would be different and it would always keep coming up with new sayings and new figures. But this gives you some sense of the quality and kind of images that were made in 1932 with the first edition IBM PC. And I think that's, uh, I'll try to uh, go, go to my next item here. I sometimes take a minute, allow me. So this gives you some sense of how I proceeded. So how did I do this serendipitous thing, this thing by chance? Well, one of the things that interested me was that I came to understand Brownian motion. 
And this was um, uh, what we're seeing here uh, is the, uh, demonstrates what was discovered by Robert Brown and published in his Poland Observations in 1827. That just Poland in a mix, uh, ultimately it will distribute itself throughout the mix. But you could see by the configurations here how it is. If you throw dice, you could end up, uh, for, if you throw dice for x and y coordinates within a certain uh, framework, uh, you can end up in the, the most simple piece of code, you can end up making uh, configurations like that. Now, here's very interesting about automatism. Automatism meaning, of course, self-making, um, automatic. Uh, automatism, brush and ink, means uh, what that meant was to draw or strike brush stroke without thinking, without editing, automatic drawing. This is that kind of drawing. And what's interesting about it is I made drawings like this for my, magic, for my um, Psalms and Silent Image. And these come from works I created when I was in Paris in 1962-63. So this would have been one of my 62 things. This was one of 180 slides in that, uh, my Psalms. Now this is an image of the frontispiece out of a, an edition that I did in honor of George Boole. And this is a robotic brush stroke. It's made pretty much like what you saw in a, a preview here today. And we, I call it epigenetic. And uh, for those of you who are interested there, you can find my essay on epigenetic art software as genotype. Uh, it's on my website. And um, it's also published in Leonardo. I think it's the first time anyone looked for the biological analogs to computer code. In a sense, what we could say is how, first I'll say a little bit word about how it's done. Uh, I cast, um, I, I, for every brush stroke, I throw dice within certain controlling parameters to establish a set of coordinates. Those coordinates become the controllers for everything else that happens in the work. So in a sense, you, 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 it, it's, it's, it's a relationship between serendipity and chance, which is pretty much like um, um, the, one, well, the first exhibition ever of computer art. This, this by the way, uh, the distribution here and the distribution of small pen strokes here uh, are all based on that fundamental initial chance created uh, set of controlling coordinates. So what's, 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 do, what's created by chance then becomes a controller. That's all kind of interesting to me theoretically. But it's also what we did was for the addition of George Bull, who's considered the father of uh, symbolic logic, we created 100 of these. So every frontispiece is different. Every end piece is different. And yet they were all made from the same parent code. That's what's interesting. That's called generative art. Uh, now, uh, I'll just run through a few examples of this type of thing. When I got back from China in 1985, uh, that's when I really, when, that's when I brought back a, a Chinese brush and I used the Chinese brushes for these editions, for, the, for, the, for my brushwork. This would be, drag, my Dragon Mountain was shown at um, Seagriff in 1990. It was one of the important ones uh, for me in Dallas, and here's a detail and another detail. But what you uh, learn is that what you can tell if, for example, you lifted, if you could lift this entire uh, cluster of pen strokes, lift them up and place them over this brush stroke, you'll, you'll be able to see the brush stroke in the cluster. So it's a kind of a play back and forth with an order. Um, so, this was shown at, um, at the ZKM for the Algorithmic Revolution. Um, this gives you a good sense of how I played with um, chance and control and distri distributions that were by chance and control. Uh, this would get to be a lot, and I think we get a bit laborious, but maybe we'll just take one little peek to understand that this is, um, this is a mural 
at the University of St. Thomas. It's called Epigenesis, the Growth of Form. And uh, the growth of form alludes to Thompson, who was, uh, was very interested in the growth of biological growth of form. Uh, there are 11 panels, and each of those panels uh, is every pen stroke and every brush stroke is based on this set of coordinates here. These yellow dots are coordinates, and the purple are, dots are were the sleepers. Uh, for the Bezier curve. So if any of you have studied um, the, in math, you'll know uh, what a non-uniform rational uh, uh, Bezier curve is. Uh, it's a curve that is computed. Um, uh, it's, it's not an ex it's non it's non rational, but in a way it is, and, it's, that it is, and, and I can't comprehend it. I only learned how to create one and write the code for one. And uh, I had a friend of mine who is it was Jean Pierre Hebert, who's a colleague, and he we duplicated it for, on one of his sand trays once when I was visiting with him. So my memorable brushstroke from the um, is repeated there. I'll just give you a very quick sense of one item here. It's the University of Minnesota, uh, it's in the Science Center of the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. And this would be the um, one of three triptychs in the unit here. Like if I trigger on this one here, that's what that one's going to be like. And then you could see this. These are all on my web pages, so if you want to find it, you can go ahead and I'll give some descriptions about what it's all about, and you'll be able to, you'll be able to see it. Uh, let me go on and show simply, you could understand very quickly how these distributions occurred. Uh, also, I have a major piece at the University, Spalding University in Louisville. It's called Flowers of Learning, and I'll just take one. This is a, uh, an example. I just wanted to show you how uh, the distribution of these randomly cast controllers uh, are employed to create that field. And I think we can show you a quick video just to give you a feel for it so that you'll appreciate it more. Uh, now this is my software. Uh, what, what I could say is that if you, what you're seeing is how I build a, a crude simulation of what I might expect. Uh, once, once, once I throw dice, establish something to work with, my code will go ahead and compute all these things for me. But what's happening is the, the, oops, sorry about that, the Bezier spline draws itself on itself. Uh, this is the spline. It never is drawn. It's only theoretical. But the, this is the same figure. So the spline draws itself on itself, and that's a piece of code to write. And I have co total control over how many uh, uh, distribution. So in this instance here, the distributions are controlled in a very severe way in this distribution here. They're allowed some random choices of color and some random placements. So again, it gives you an idea of how I, my code works between random and control. And what you need to know underneath this is a whole theory, a whole thing about life itself. It's like us how you feel sometimes, your passion and your compassion and how you are as a person in that sense. You could be um, really not understand that. And you might even be expressive of some of that in a kind of automatism drawing or writing. It's like throwing dice, something happens. At the same time, your reason drives you another way. You always have this tension. It's in this sense that you will often hear me talk about the resolution of opposites, trying somehow, like, in the, like we do in Oriental thing, bring to resolution these two elements. I think in my most recent work uh, for my Apocalypse for uh, San Marco uh, is a good example where the, these, these are the controlling coordinates, but these coordinates were just 
in a sense, a random throw of the dice. On the other hand, that's what I had to work with and bringing my good sense to it and allowing play back and forth between the two, you can end up, I ended up with something like this ultimately. This work, this is my recent work called Mergings. This piece of work here, this is actually from a drawing I made back in maybe 19, 67, probably 68. But this is algorithmic drawing that you just saw the coordinates for. And each of these characters is also written in with a computer code I've written for uh, simulating language. And I can translate this. It says existence and non-existence give birth the one to the other. It's almost like it doesn't matter what it is. You have to know dark to appreciate light. You have to know light to appreciate dark. It's like sweet and sour. It's like your passion and your reason. You get to know to bring this in harmony is, is the game for me and for life. Now, uh, I think if I had anything to say in my work, uh, that's what it's about. Now, I'm going to summarize by saying this. In my lifetime as an artist, uh, as an algorist, and my algorithmic art, I have celebrated three people whom I consider to be very important. They're very important for the evolution of the computer. And I'll say a little bit for each one. George Bull, for his derivation of the laws of logic, he is considered the father of symbolic logic. And you all probably know what Boolean operators are. All code is based on Boolean operators. If George, and there is an, an article I wrote on George Bull uh, for my book, for my Bull book. You can find that book on my website and you could read my statement. I think it's an important statement. And so I have celebrated him. The other person I've celebrated is Alan Turing. Now, Turing, when, when Alan Turing um, created the, the, the um, I've celebrated the universal Turing machine. Here's an example. It's, it's, it's projecting a little larger than I wanted, but uh, maybe I can, well, it doesn't matter. There we go. This helps right here. You're probably seeing these ones and zeros that are here are actually from Roger Penrose. They're quoted from Roger Penrose, Emperor's New Mind. They are actually the ones and zeros for a universal Turing machine. In 1995, I mounted this as a graphic. It goes back and forth a little bit. But contained in, the, in, this, um, uh, in, in this image are the actual code for a universal Turing machine. What's a universal Turing machine? Well, my cell phone, for example. This computer. These are all universal Turing machines. They can compute what's computable one way or another. And uh, it might take um, even... even uh, so, so anyway... I presented this as a self-portrait <laughs> of the machine by which it's made in um, 1995. And there still is a version on the web, so you could go ahead and look at my projects on, my, on the web and you will find an example. Finally, the other person I celebrated and haven't talked about here is Norbert Wiener. What was important about Norbert Wiener is that um, he wrote a book on a social, he, he was a physicist and, and a mathematician uh, who worked on bomb sites during World War II. He was very interested in the human relationship to the machine. He recognized that this was a tremendous thing, what was going to happen down the road, and so he wrote about the social implications of the machine that were to come, and we have them now before us. But he knew this back in the 40s. So I created this series of um, uh, what we called, what I called decision machines. Uh, in, uh, in the 1980s um, and um, late 70s and 1980s, this one anyway is um, 
the Vatican, right or wrong. If you click, if you have this machine, it's actually circuits or alive, and you have the original, and you press this button, and you can say, is this act right or wrong? And the Vatican says, uh, let's see, he's supposed to work. Why isn't he working? He always worked. Oh, there he worked. He said, it's wrong. <laughs> so you get the idea. Uh, it's, it's sort of just, let, let me try another one so you get an idea. This is a, so you're an investor today and the market's going up or down or whatever, and you don't know whether to buy or sell. This is buy, this is sell. What shall I do? Uh, it, it, it does, there we go. He says, sell. Better get rid of it, stock. So I give you an idea, okay? They, they are interesting. I made a whole series of these in honor of Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener, and you might look at them on the web, you can play with them, but also read my statements there to say why these people were important. Wiener is the father of cybernetics. He was believed to have been the first to, to have used the term, but I think we learned later that there was someone who used that term earlier. My cyber flowers, in a sense, grew from my understanding of Wiener's work. And he was the person who introduced us to the importance of the human-machine dialectic. And it's only now with artificial intelligence emerging so strongly that we uh, begin to appreciate him again much more. And then uh, when, I, when I say that, I, I have to tell you that in my time, people like myself and um, Harold Cohen, uh, we all believed we were working with artificial intelligence. I believe that my very simple master code is a kind of an intelligent code. It can make, it creates the ideas, the art ideas that I have embedded in the code. Well, so I think by way of conclusion, I'd like to show you a little clip of my um, um, three-story drawing machine. This is, is broad, this is projected on the um, facade of, this was projected on the facade of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 2011. story drawing machine is a project uh, I think the only uh, occasion anyone ever documented a drawing like that it's, it took eight hours from sunset to sunrise we projected it all night at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design for a, for a um, what used to be called a white night and that's every year we have that uh, we have such an event in Minneapolis thank you Thank you.